Before I came, I was asked a list of topics. I provided some, and this was selected Torah restriction or liberty. In essence, just as a, an introduction, one of the most difficult challenges in life generally for those unaccustomed to Jewish practice and even those accustomed perhaps more is to feel that sense of simchas hachaim that joie de vivre I don't know how you say that in Afrikaans it's a French saying but that joy in life at that sense of tachlis and in truth we know our rabbis write extensively about the importance of simcha shal mitzvah the importance of feeling that happiness but to feel really motivated to feel that sense of we have the keys of life in our hands how do we do that we know famously in ethics of our fathers and perky others Chazal tell us our rabbis highlight the verse in the Luchais when the, the Ten Commandments were given on tablets of stone. It says, Vamichtav, Michtav, Elekimhu, and the writing was the writing of God, Chorus al Haluchais, engraved on the tablets. And the Mishnah says, Our sages tell us, Al Tikre Chorus Elo Chorus. Don't read it as free as Chorus engraved. Read it as if it was written Cherus. It's the same letters and there are no vowels in the Torah. It's to tell us that the very engraving of Torah on a person's heart is the true Cherus. She'en lecha ben Cherin. You have no true free person. Elo misha isek ba Torah. Other than somebody who toils in Torah learning. And that perhaps compounds the question and increases the challenge. How can it be that being Isaac Batura, toiling in Torah is freedom? It's not a new question. Every Pesach night at the Seder table, Keneged Arbo Bonim Dibra Torah corresponding to the four sounds the Torah speaks. Echod Chochom, Echod Rosha, Echod Tamsh, Echod Chenid Elishel. The wicked sound asks, what on earth is all this work? This is freedom? This is your way of celebrating the end of servitude? This is freedom to sit with all the restrictions and all the chukim and all the statutes, all the limitations, all the don'ts, all the negatives. All that you can't do. I and mean, you can't even have a single malt at the Pesach table. And that really is hard. That's why we say Manishtan Alayla Zemikol Alayla as well. Depends which house. <laughs> so that is the Avoida. Moha Avoida Zoyislochem. How do we feel Cherus? Perhaps by way of introduction to a bit of an approach. Torah being instruction. Liberty. We know that at Mount Sinai it says, Vayichan Shom Yisrael Neged Ahor, Vayisyatsvu, they camp, they station themselves, Besachtis Ahor. Besachtis means at the base of the mountain. But our rabbis tell us the word Tachtis also means Tachat underneath. There's a famous line in the Gemara, the Talmud writes, in Shabbos, the Gemara says, they weren't just around the base of the mountain, the mountain was on top of them. Kofo Aleim Harakigigis, God lifted up the mountain and shook it over the heads like a barrel and said to them, Imte Kablu Mutav, if you accept the Torah, good. Vimlav, and if not, Shom Teheikvuraschem, there you will be buried. Shom Teheikvuraschem. They were coerced. We were coerced. And all the Rishonim, all our sages, and all the commentaries in the Gemara ask the question, we'd already said Naseh and Ishma. We'd already accepted the Torah of our own free will. God had offered it and we said, yes, how much does it cost? And he said, it's free. And we said, we'll take two. Naseh and Ishma, we will do. And Ishma, we will listen. So what do we need to be forced after it was already something we'd accepted? Naseh and Ishma. 
Additionally, if you're holding a barrel over people's head, we say in English, you've got them over a barrel. And Chazal, it says, you've got them under the barrel or in the barrel. If you're holding it over them and there's a threat to drop that mountain and to bury them on the spot, why do you say, Shom Tehei Kuraschem, there you will be buried? It should be, Kam Tehei Kuraschem, here you will be buried. I've got the mountain over you guys here. And if you accept it, good. If not, you're buried there. What's Shom Tehei Kuraschem? Said the Holy Chofetz Chaim, whose legacy is so strong amongst Klal Yisrael, amongst our people, but so particularly here, by the power of Torah from Radin, and all the other Lithuanian and Polish yeshivas is so strongly felt in the genetic pool of the Lithuanian community here. Said the Chovetz Chaim, a simple but such a fundamental point. He said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was telling us the following. Yes, indeed, we said, Na'asev and Ishma, we will do and we will hear. We accept. Yes. But if we accept it, and we think it's on our terms, then it's as long as we feel those terms stay in place. In a future generation, in distant shores, not under Har Sinai, not in Mount Sinai, but maybe Melbourne, Australia, Johannesburg, South Africa, or maybe in Budapest in Hungary, or London, England. If we so will it, we opted in, we'll opt out. You know, we accept it on our terms, and now we're changing the terms and conditions. On that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I'm not forcing you because of the mountain. I want you to learn the lesson. If you accept it and it stays as your lives, good. But if not in any generation, that Torah isn't central to our lives, wherever it may be in the future. You will be buried. And what does that mean to be buried? Shom Teik Vuraschem. I want to share some thoughts with you about this burial, so to speak. As a rule, man's a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. When it's cool, he wants it hot, always wanting what it's not. That's a direct quote of a fridge magnet of a neighbor of ours from 30 years ago. But I think it's a wonderful quote. As a rule, man's a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. When it's cool, he wants it hot. Always wanting what is not. I never failed to be amazed as a rabbi in Caulfield in Melbourne. How in the winter, as you have it here, in June, July, August, at Hever Rebbe, we're going up north to get a bit of sound. We go to surface paradise. They would fly up to surface paradise. Not the paradise sort, but the surface sort of paradise. And get some sound. In the summer months, in December, January, Rebbe, it's hot, we're going off to Europe, we're going skiing, Switzerland. I said, I've got a simple deal, you know, stay here June, July, August, you get the lovely winter weather. And in the summer, when it's nice and hot, stay here and go to the beach. But why in the middle of the winter you have to go off to the sun? In the middle of the summer, you've got to go off to the snow. Okay, it could be something to do with the other side of the world, living in Australia, a bit upside down, I don't know. As a rule, man's a fool. When it's hot, we want it cool. When it's cool, we want it hot. Always wanting what it's not. We say in Shema, Hashem You must love Hashem, your God. We must love God with all our heart. Our rabbis say, it doesn't say in the singular tense or the single organ tense, with all your heart, with one weight, it says it with two, indicating a duality. What duality are we are referring to? And the Mishnah says in Baruchus, We've got to love God with our positive, good inclination, with the good fellow within us, and with the evil inclination, you've got to love God as well. You've got to go love God with all the negative thoughts as well. And everybody asks, how can you love God with your Yetzirah? Hara? We can understand with the Yetzirah Hatoiv, with your soul. You want to go off and serve Hashem and daven and learn and do mitzvahs. But with your goof, with your body, how do you do it? So in truth, 
and in essence of a person. Did Dr. Doolittle get to these shores? Didn't do, did it more than I thought, though. He just didn't do little. Dr. Doolittle came here, but he had an animal on board called the Push Me Pull You. Remember the Push Me Pull You? It was a llama and a camel pulling, stuck together, a donkey, stuck in the back, and a shot in the kilai, a crossbreed, pulling in different directions. Huh? When we're born into the world, we have conflict within us. We have two different forces we know within us. And those two forces can pull a person in different directions. In fact, the body and soul, call it heart and mind, instinct and intellect, spirit and physical side, however we coin the phrases, the yin and yang, the up and whatever, they're pulling in different directions. The soul wants to aspire to achievements, to eternity, to great things, to intellectual things, to look upwards, to elevate. And the body wants the next meal and a bit of fun. How do we get the two together? They're pulling in different directions and it can be painful. And the biggest challenge is, for those of us who know a little bit about soccer, we think we do, the greatest advantage is home ground advantage. The body is on home ground and the soul is on the away territory. And all the advantages in the court of the body and we start from the youngest age. I want, I want, I want, I need. We cry and we're fed and then pampered. And we go through a process, little children, little problems, bigger children, bigger problems. And one constant process of wanting and needing. So when the soul wants to take over and the intellect wants to stimulate, how do we get stimulated? That's the verse we say each Shabbat morning. Teirah Sashem Temimo Meshivas Nofesh. The key, not to depriving ourselves of this world, God forbid, but using this world correctly, knowing how to use the gifts of life and life's pleasures and God's blessings. How to make sure we're not in a situation of always wanting what it's not, but being able to want what it is while we have it and find the balance and the synthesis in life to enjoy what we have. Toiras Hashem Temimo Meshivas Nofesh. The Torah of God is complete, is perfect. It calms the soul. That crying soul which is on away ground and feels in hostile territory and the enemy is being barracked for the opposition. Give us the Torah and the Torah says, eat. Yes, make sure you eat. Don't fast unless it's for a purpose. But eat with a bracha, something kasher, the right way. And on Shabbos and Yom Tov, eat for my sake and enjoy it. Enjoy the beautiful world I've made for you. Don't ignore it. But do it with a purpose and use it the way it's meant to be used. Don't destroy it. Don't overindulge. Torah Hashem Tamimot gives us that synthesis of two antithetical things. And body and soul can start working in synchronization. And then there aren't the complexities of the push me pull you. They're pulling in the same direction. There's a wonderful, powerful marshal about a trickster a clown, a pied piper walks into a kid's playground and as is the case with every child you tell them I've got a surprise I've got a secret, come and catch me I'll show you what I've got and the children start running after this clown figure and say show us, surprise, you can open your hand, we want to see you've got to catch him and he starts walking away and they start following him, he walks out of the playground don't do, it, don't do it at home, it's not a politically correct story they ran out of school and the clown runs down the street and run after him. Catch him, catch him. They're running and running and he's running further. You've got to catch me. So let's get the kid. They're trying to hop him. He comes down the street across the road through the park and it starts raining. Something that doesn't seem to happen too much here, at least not now. And they're wet and it's muddy and they're on a trip over and through the, through the trees and through the bushes. And they're carrying on. They're out of town already and they're running and they're breathless and dirty and tired. Get him, get him. And he's running ahead. And finally, finally, 
They get to a point, they surrounded him because he's running by the banks of a river and they surround him and he can't run any further and he can't cross the river. And they say, we've got you. Now you're going to show us your surprise. And he stands there and let me show you children. And he opens his fists and he shows nothing. Silly children. Did you stop and think perhaps it's not worth chasing? Did you think for a moment perhaps it's not worth getting your clothes torn? You're going to have hell to pay at home or mother to on your back and filthy and tired and wasted time and soiled and coyotes. Did you stop and think is it worth ripping your shoes with this? But you were just so caught up, weren't you? Says Ibn Nachman mi Breslov. We are those kids. From the moment we can do anything, we start running. Running and running after that elusive happiness. Just the next thing. Just the next toy. Jack's just the next model. Upgrade. And the next holiday. And the next, and the next enlargement. Yes, I'll be happy then. Just keep running. Don't stop and think. In fact, the Maharal says the word for this world, land, is Eretz, which comes from Rotsoin, desire, which comes from Eritzo, running, because we don't stop running. And we can run through life accumulating toys, trying to get just that next thing for happiness. And we think it's just going to be the next model, I mean, that next upgrade, I mean, the next car will be so brilliant, I mean, until the next model comes out, and the next one. And whatever our toy may be, just tick the box appropriate, whether it's the next perfume, the next film, the next computer game, the next computer program, whatever it may be. Until finally we stop running. Oh, we can't run anymore. We've caught that chap we've been running after. And that's when our car is being driven, if at all, by the person our life has taken over from us. Because he's driving us on our final journey. And he drives us saying goodbye and we haven't got the opportunity to run anymore have we used that time correctly says of Nachman me Breslov it's a very powerful moshul a very powerful parable when we get up in the morning we say thank you God you've given me life I can wake up and I can get up and we make the blessings in the morning from the crack of dawn, Hanoten la sech vivin ala havchin, Hanoisin la sech vivin ala havchin, Ben yemi ben loilo. And if you want to know how lucky we are sitting here, go for one hour for a visit to a hospital and see the people who are less fortunate than we are here now and how blessed we are with all the gifts that we have. And we have so much to be delighted, exultant about. And we're obviously enormously appreciative for Yet we don't always stop and think what we have as long as we're running after the next thing which will find happiness. And as long as that Yetzirah can say, don't, don't enjoy it, just the next and the next. Torah is the balance to say, stop and think. You've been given gifts today. The greatest gift we have is the gift of the time of life that we're at. That's why it's called the present. It's the greatest gift we have. Every opportunity that manifests itself. But in the push me, pull you in life, it's so hard to appreciate it. And at times, if we don't stop and think, we end up overshooting and missing all life's blessings. Says the Torah, don't deprive yourselves. The holiest of holy people, the high priest on the holiest of holy days in Yom Kippur, had to be in a marital relationship, otherwise he was disqualified. Because part of life is to be married and to have a family, the extent we're able to do so. Part of life is not to deny ourselves pleasures, it's to use them the right way, in the right balance, in the right measure. The ability to be able to choose to be a Ben Chorin is not the freedom to do what we feel like doing. If it was the freedom to do what we feel like doing, which child would ever go to school? Which of us would ever have the main course at a meal when we're young? We'll all be eating desserts the whole time. And who would live to the bar mitzvah and bas mitzvah? That's not what we feel like doing. Freedom is the opportunity to carry out that which we know is right. 
Ein lecha ben chayrin el amisha isik batayra. When Torah gives rhyme, a reason, direction and focus to every mundane act. Getting up in the morning has value. Going to the bathroom and coming out and saying perhaps the greatest of all baruchos, the blessing of Asher Yotzar is Hodon Take that as an example. You think about going to the bathroom and hygiene coming out and then take it into our minds. We make a blessing. Thanking God for the brilliance of creation and the fact that he didn't only create us, sustain us, provide us the wherewithal to have a digestive system which can take into it food and then transport it through a hundred thousand kilometers of blood vessels around the body, every particle getting where it needs to. And then take the waste and expel it from the body, completing the process of healthy living. And all this while, um, keeping body and soul together, harnessed in partnership. Thank you, God, when I come out from the bathroom. For all my health, um, we could be bouncing around with joy from that blessing alone. But in life, we tend to run and run and run and not stop to think about the blessings along the way. Torah says, take the most mundane act. If it's done in a way you understand God has given you the opportunity, it becomes a way of connecting with, of picking up an apple and realizing just before you gulp it down, down the gullet it goes and carry on your day. That was grown from a pip. And imagine, imagine the Bizeicha to buy a new car, a nice a Rolls Royce, a Lexus. And you open the dashboard, your Lexus, proud new owner of a Lexus, or BMW, which is what the car's here, necessarily of stature. And you see in the dashboard, congratulations, you've won 10 new Lexuses. Maybe that should be Lexi, I don't know. <laughs> Lexuses. But surely, I can go back to the showroom, I'm driving out with 11. They open each of those dashboards, and each one is another 10. In five minutes, I bankrupted Toyota. Every pip has the potential to grow a tree. Within 10 years, can be hundreds of thousands of trees. In each pip. And we take that sign of divine greatness. Calp it down our gullets. Chuck away the core, the pips, the thing which interfere with our enjoyment. Chuck it out. Throw a pip into the ground and you made this wonderful tree which can create an orchard for my benefit, for me. I was created by design for a purpose. And God, I realize you've given it to me. That apple is a source, that one simple blessing, a connecting point throughout the day with a purpose of life and a sense of achievement if I choose to use it correctly. It reminds me that the whole wine industry in Australia, along the Barossa Valley, the north of Adelaide, in New South Wales, there are thousands of wineries already, but the whole Barossa Valley started from a few pips brought from the French Riviera when the first fleet sailed in 1788 and somebody chucked out the pips. A few years later, they had the most wonderful wine industry from a couple of pips. But we've got to realize the good fortune we have. I read a little story from a hero of mine, Rabbi Ossel Friedensen, or Friedensen, was nifter recently in America. He came from Lodge in Poland. And there was a series of books which were written by the Tells Yeshiva, I think it was, in Cleveland, or the high school, studying Holocaust studies, but through the life stories of certain survivors. And in the section, The World That Was Poland, he relates the following. He said, he merited the good fortune of not ending up in an extermination camp. He was in a work camp, and the director of the work camp, I'll give the name in a moment, was a fellow called Pape. He was a Bruno Pape. 
He was a kind man, not a real Nazi, and he wasn't the anti-Semites that the rest were. And he goes through fascinating insights. One Shmini Atzeres, we were in the smithy shop, but had not been assigned any work to do. Since it was Yom Tov, working in the workshop in a labor camp under Nazi control, we were singing the niggun. They were singing it amongst themselves. Picture 15 year old Polish boys. Without parents, without any knowledge of the future, singing one of our Simchas Torah songs in a labor camp. Papi comes running into the room. He looked at us singing and said, what is that you are singing? What are you singing? We explained the entire song that we were singing and we came to the words, the part that mentions, Ein There's no merit in the world like Torah. Ein ki Israel. And there's nobody as wise in Torah as the Jews. He said to them, you Jews wise, do you still believe in it? Glaubst? There was a boy, a Jewish boy, not even from our religious group, who was aside in the bunks and didn't get involved with anybody else, he writes. He jumped up and screamed out in German, Ja, ich glaub, I believe. And then he went round the room and he asked all of us and we all said, we believe. And Pape said, Rabbi Sai, listen to this. I don't know how the Führer will ever get rid of you. Because we believed. In the camps, in the darkest moments, when tells Yeshiva, Zaydis of Kehillah members here, were being led to the slaughter. They were singing, Matov Chalkeinu, how happy are we are, we received the Torah. We lived with a purpose. We know we have an eternity. We know we have a purpose. And we know that every minute has a purpose. And if God wants to take our lives, allow our lives be taken, He will answer for it. We've done right. They've done wrong. Ashreinu Matov Chalkeinu. Who was free? Pape? All these boys. But I want to add one point. For those who are studying Dafayomi, the daily folio, which is studied around the world in Talmud Bavli, for those who can do it, there's a fascinating little insight in today's Daf. It's in Masechet Erevin, Tractate Erevin, page 100b, Kufam al Beis. The Gemara makes the following line, makes the following observation. Amr Rabbi Yechen, Rabbi Yechen stated, Il mole nitna Torah with a Torah not to have been given. Hainu lemeidin, we would have been able to learn snius, the attribute of modesty. Mechatul, from a cat. Because cats are modest in their conduct. And they don't mess around in the streets like dogs do. The gazelle, and avoiding stealing. Minamolo, from an ant. Because ants are industrious, but an ant will never pick up the piece, the grain, which has already been picked up by another ant and take it away. Varoyos, and correct behavior in morality, miyoino, which stays faithful to its partner, etc. And I heard some in 1983, 30 years ago, at the Hesped, given for Rableib Malata. Rableib Gurvitz, the Rosh Hashiva of my Yeshiva, came from the town of Malat in Lithuania, in Lita. One of the Maspidim, one of the people who gave a eulogy, quoted this Gemara, and he asked the following question. What does it mean if Torah wouldn't have been given? And now that Torah has been given, can't we observe that conduct from the cat and from the animals and the various forces of nature, the various animals? Couldn't we have learned industry from an ant? Can't we still learn its honesty? And that he answered the following in the name of the Rav of Brisk. He said, if Torah hadn't been given, God forbid, 
if we would have thought ourselves as free of being able to have the responsibility of having to choose, then we could have learnt by observation. We would have kept snoot because it's correct and it's good even in the animal kingdom you find it. Honestly, because the ants do it. Now that the Torah is given, now that we have our way of life and our code of conduct, the reason we don't steal isn't because the ants don't, or because it's the right thing not to steal, it's because God says don't steal. And all that that connotes, beyond the parameters of the strict letter of the law, the way Torah values tell us, that trains us for life. If it was only because of our observation from nature, about being sonua, with modesty and unpretentiousness, it would have been by observation only, we would have been careful in certain areas. But all the laws within families and all our conduct, now that we have a Torah, it governs every area of marital conduct and family issues. That is how we were created to synthesize body and soul. And that's how we can get maximum value out of the experiences in this world. Il mole Torah, had Torah not been given, we may have come to conclusions. Now that Torah has been given, we have the way of life mapped out and how to lead that life and choose the freedom of living life within its correct values. If we feel push me, pull you, harried and tarried and pulled in different directions, if we're always wanting what it's not, stop. Take a Shabbos and realize what it means to lead life with spiritual values. Think about the bracha you're making, the tefillah you're about to make, mincha. What it means to stand before God and believe fully God is listening to our every word. And then communicate. And then realize after mincha you're a different person who finished the Shemona Esrei than the one who began it. Stop and think about the purpose and blessing within our families of our children. Are they merely nachas givers for us? Or are they the greatest objectives of our lives and the greatest opportunities of fulfilling our responsibilities towards Hashem and towards our people? When we have that sort of question, if our Naseh Nishma is ongoing, our preparedness to realize what our decisions are based on, then we can appreciate the cold when it's cold and the hot when it's hot. And believe me, when you come from the wonderful, glorious, cloudy, rain-filled summer of London to the glorious, to the dark, cold, blue sky, sunny winter here, you can appreciate the winter when it's winter and the summer when it's meant to be summer. But in life we can find appreciation of all those things. Dovar be'itoi matoiv, without running constantly away for the next thing, but for the values we seek so dearly to appreciate the gift of life. I had the experience just about a year ago now, just under a year ago, to meet Rabbi Raf for the first time in Lublin in Poland. We were there in Lublin because it was the Dafayo Museum. It was the culmination of seven and a half years of study of the daily folio of Gomorrah, which approximately once in seven and a half years the cycle is finished. And the innovator of the whole process of a daily a study of a daily daf around the world, a common daf being learnt, was a famed Ramer Shapiro, who was the legendary founder of the yeshiva of Lublin, for which he collected extensively in America, and it became the model for Polish yeshivas. And he died, if I recall correctly, in 1936, at a very young age. He was a member of the Polish parliament, a tremendous orator, but a great visionary. Just for good measure, the Seum in America had 100,000 participants, 100,000 participants this time in the summer of last year, the northern summer I hasten to add. The reason I was in Lublin was because seven and a half years beforehand, I'd also been in Lublin to start this cycle. And I went there at the time, it was the middle of the winter, it was February. It was minus 10, minus 15 outside, and the Seum was made at about two o'clock in the morning to synchronize with America. Groups had come from America. And the actual building of the yeshiva, the 
the building which had been the yeshiva, which throughout the communist era had been used by the, as a nursing school by the Soviets and, and the Polish authorities, had just, been given back, been, had just been given back to the community. It didn't have electricity everywhere. Generators had come in. We're sitting in the base Hamedrash in the study hall, which had theater seating, probably could fit two, three hundred people. And I was given the privilege of being Messiah, of concluding the last um, cycle of Tafayomi. Present in that hall were groups from around Europe who had come from all the Lauda Foundation and Reichman institutions, from the former Soviet Union countries, from Ukraine, from Berlin and Germany. Groups had come with Madrichim, boys from Yeshiva, had come to be inspired from this event. I want to tell you one little story. Two o'clock in the morning, it was freezing. We finished Shas, finished the whole cycle, concluded at the same time we were doing it in America. And then we had music playing. And we started dancing around the room and getting everybody together. We were singing Baruch Elekein Shabbat Shalom they were singing the same in America. And as I was going around the room, I was picking up the boys and joining the big circle. One madrich says, Geb acht, leave him alone. It's a 14, 15 year old boy. Be careful with him. He had his bris two days ago and he got on a bus two hours later for a 26 hour trip here. The proverbial blew my mind occurred at that moment. And I danced, I took his hand, danced gingerly with him, but with such an elated spirit of the Kedusha of our people. Six and a half years later, two and a half years ago from now, I was at a conference in Berlin. There's a yeshiva today in Berlin, formed predominantly from former Soviet emigres, from former Soviet, former Soviet countries. And they had a conference of European rabbis, a meeting there to give chizuk, to give support for the rabbis there and for the yeshiva. And the Rosh based in Dain Errantry was going to give a shir in a base hamedrash in a study hall full of boys. And all the 30 or 40 rabbis with the meeting were asked to prepare for the shir with different groups of boys. And I was sitting with a couple of boys and everybody was, and it was a, a ruach of Torah learning like a, a proper yeshiva. I was cocking as they say, the steam was coming out. Somebody walks up to me, a bocher, and he says, Shalom Aleichem. He says, you probably don't remember. Last time I met you, I couldn't dance. Now can I dance with you? I saw him two months ago. I was Shabbos in Berlin with the family at the yeshiva. Rabbi Isai, we have that simcha. We have that way of life. We have that balance. And I repeat, as I mentioned earlier, this conference, this indaba, whatever that means, but what I've come to learn, it's, it's a base hamedrash. It's a thirst for Torah. It's a thirst for MS. It's a thirst for self-improvement. It's a thirst for coming together, whatever it is. But this indaba shows enduring power of that Torah. And think about your grandparents and their grandparents and little particularly from those killers whose life's blood was Torah learning and they had that happiness and that balance. And they bequeathed to you, to us, a love of that life, of that learning, to realize there's value in everything we do. We are the B'nai Khairin, we're the ultimate free people. No Pape, no Hitler, no Assad, no PLO, no United, disunited nations, the abomination of a place. We don't have to worry about them. We have bcherus. We have our freedom. Because we can make the choices in everything we do. Asher bochar bonu. God chose us so we can choose this way of life. If we do and continue to do so, we'll see that blessing pouring forth in our families, in our communities. And we'll see that simcha sachaim, that celebration of those Torah values, continue to consolidate themselves, the lives of our communities and all of Klal Israel, until we merit to dance with those boys from around Europe and around Johannesburg, around Melbourne, Australia, 
And Yushalayim Yer HaKedosh singing again, Baruch Elekeinu, and singing, Ein Adir Kashem, Ein Zechiyah Katora, Ve'ein Chachameha Ki Yisrael, with the coming of Mashiach Zidkeinu, Bimei Rav Yameinu, Amen.